So you, you pick the right people because we're specialists in understanding the local context. That's yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. yeah. I just Terrific. want to add something on Hermes's point. Okay. Uh, uh, social, work, uh, social work as a profession, uh, it was started before 1974. Mm -hmm. And uh, starting from 1974 up to 2006, there was no social work department in Ethiopia okay. for your information. Okay. So, just uh, the, uh, the, in addition to that, there, there, there are no even uh, the, there is no uh, in a professor number of professors, social work professors in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. uh, before 1991, Ethiopia was under socialist uh, perspective, communism. So they didn't uh, give that much respect for social work uh, as a profession and uh, as a profession as a profession and. Uh, as a, a structure, there, there is no platform and a ladder of communication starting okay. from the local community up to the highest position. Right. So I think Gondor University is our university, is the first university to launch uh, even the concept of indigenous social work in the uh, indigenous social work course in, the, in its uh, syllabus. So, uh, so the history and uh, the professional structure and the number of uh, scholars in the country contributes a lot about the uh, lack of contribution on the uh, indigenous social work practices in Ethiopia. Actually, uh, the, there are uh, lots of issues in Africa. Africans are the ones who come up with the, the idea of indigenous social work uh, creation in Africa. There are lots of movements in, uh, from, uh, in uh, African social work professionals. They are the ones who uh, strive a lot on the launching indigenous social work practices or decolonizing social work in Africa. But the problem is in Ethiopia we were never being colonized just before and in, in terms of physical uh, invasion. But in terms of knowledge, the Western perspective totally uh, work from uh, from uh, up to bottom. We are totally the, so the scholars highly appreciate the Western perspective than the uh, local practice. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. I so can't believe how articulate. That's, that's, mm -hmm. a that's, a, that's a problem. Yeah. When some, there, are, there, there are some scholars who give some appreciation for the local perspective. But when you come up with uh, when you come up with such ideas, even the scholars themselves they, they didn't give you that much good respect. Right. They just uh, see right. you as uh, uh, 
backward or undeveloped uh, scholar. Yeah. So plus to that, okay, carry on. Well, good for you. I mean, I congratulations for seeing the seeing that. That is crucial. I mean, it, I'm just astounded that you even see it. Yeah. That's that's just terrific. Yeah, and it, it's very brave well, too. It's, it's, it's brave. Brave, especially yeah, a lot in, of courage. Yes. Yeah, in a research. Um, yeah. I think I think just a setting where even the Western Company mm -hmm. is okay. Sorry, there is a communication here. Oh, no problem. No problem. Okay. Okay. I, yeah, we're here. Our connection okay. is outstanding. I'm mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm listening. My connection is not good, that's why. Oh, it's not, because uh, ours is excellent. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's very, very good here. I can see you both. I am and, listening. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but um, I, I think to go off of that, too, I think it's very brave that you continue to challenge kind of the quantitative leaning norms of perhaps your department, the kind of the uh, academic setting there. Um, because I mean, I think we're in a similar position here too, um, because I, when I was going up for my dissertation proposal, um, I, I did hear from different faculty that a qualitative study may not be um, in my best interest, especially if I was planning to go on the job market because um, you know, a lot of different schools are looking for students, um, you know, working with large data sets, um, you know, thousands of participants. And if I was just planning to do a smaller qualitative study with 15 to 20 participants, they, they weren't sure how valuable that would be and how beneficial it would be for me on the job market. And so I, I think, you know, you just have to take a stand at some point. Um, and I think maybe the best time might be as a PhD student yeah. um, to just say, you know, this is the direction I want to go in. And I think what I will find will be valuable um, to someone. Oh my God, I mean, what you're saying is, is so incredibly significant in terms of the colonization too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that's what I'm congratulating mm -hmm. you on is that you can see that you don't want to be colonized in terms of your scholarship. No. You you want your own scholarship and that's yes. wonderful. Yes. That's wonderful. I Yeah, if it is possible. It is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, this is your way. It, it is it is possible and we're we're on our way together here. Okay. No. Okay, anything else you want to say before we move on? Because, uh, you know, I, I just used the term culturally wise research. You know, I, I never heard that. I don't think I've heard it before. And I don't know if that's even uh, a good term to use. Uh, indigenous research is really obvious is, is of obvious importance but I have just a little quibble with the word indigenous because all research is indigenous in a way um, and so I don't know so maybe we have to decide what we call the kind of research you want to do do we call it Ethiopia specific research uh, do we call it uh, culturally sensitive research what 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 language should we use Culturally sensitive sound better. For Culturally me. sensitive, okay. Yeah. Culturally because sensitive. The, 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 because of our contextual circumstances, we are, we are using a Western language to write our dissertation and uh, to conduct the research, and uh, lots of things are based on so. But while we are using other uh, language and uh, research platform, we need to uh, be sensitive for our cultural issues. Good. So I prefer culture sensi cultural sensitivity. I think that sounds better for. Okay. And and this this thing about paradigm shifts. Um, I thought about that because. I think it was Ajano who wants everything to happen in the next 10 years, you know, this just this transformation. And 
you know, and I, you know, I'm, I'm older now, so I under, I still understand his impatience, and I, and I share that impatience. I want things to change 50 years ago, or 200 years ago, or a thousand years ago. Um, but also, living as long as I have, I know that I have to see myself as one of many, many people working on these issues, and together. And I don't know most of the people who are working on these issues of social transformation, because that's what I'm interested in, too. But there are a lot of people working on social transformation, and I have to believe that, and I have to have faith in that, that together we will eventually change the culture. But So we have to have faith that our individual work will have a cumulative effect at some point, and we don't know when. So that's that's yeah. that's what I wanted to say about that. That with a paradigm shift, that means that something really changes, and so it results from a slow accumulation of knowledge, and then you get to a tipping point where things actually change. Yeah, yeah. So, and participatory action research, which some of you are interested in, yeah. um, is a social transformation on the local level. And to get to participatory action research, you need to understand the local level. You need to understand the people in the local level. You need to understand their perspectives, their viewpoints, their experiences. And believe me, the only way I know to understand perspectives on the local level is to do grounded theory or deductive qualitative analysis. Or some people might call it phenomenological research, whatever you want to call it. But our two specialties are, are deductive qualitative analysis and grounded theory. Mm -hmm. And that is broadly phenomenological. And phenomenology means that I'm just trying to understand people's experiences in context. And the context is multi-layered and it does go all the way up to global influences. And when you do deductive qualitative analysis of grounded theory, you can listen to what people are saying, describe what people are saying, and you can identify the global influences in what they're saying. I mean, I do that in my research on violence. I can see that a man says such and such and such, but I can say, you know, Gaddafi said that. And Gaddafi was a, you know, he was head of a country. That's global. But this man who molested 10 children is saying the same thing. So that's what I mean by you can listen to what people are saying, and, and, but you have to get a good description first. And then you can do the analysis and say, my God, he just said, I want what I want what I, when I want it. You know, I, I want to feel good. I'm going to make you do what I want you to do because I'm the boss. Big me, little you. Well, that's what dictators are. The men who molest children, who rape women, who beat up women, you know, who murder other men, they have the same beliefs as Gaddafi or, or, or Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the abuser in chief, as far as I'm concerned. He is just the, he's like the personification of everything I've studied for the last 35 years. And so he is a global figure. And we have these little guys, you know, who molest, some, some people I've interviewed have molested up to three or four hundred children. So in many ways, their thinking is no different from Donald Trump's. And yeah. so then you look at people who use pornography, and then you look at all the different ways that these same ideas are playing out, and you see, I'm not dealing, I'm dealing with a local issue here, but the local issue is connected globally. Yeah. And so that's the kind of analysis I'd like to see, if you're interested in all the multiple influences, that's the kind of thing that you could do as well. If you start with a good description, you know, if you have people who are really telling you the truth of their lives, and to get people to tell the truth of their lives, you have to develop a relationship with them, and, and they have to begin to trust you. But believe me, the, the things you talked about last week in terms of all the influences, 
They are right there in the text that you develop or that you gather. But you just have to have the eyes to see them. And that's, that's what a sensitizing concept is. A sensitizing concept are eyes that help you see things that you might not otherwise have seen. So the analysis is that you want to do, you can do with DQA and, and GT. Yeah. Mm, I think that... Uh, deductive positive analysis, uh, deductive positive research. Uh, this is totally a new concept for me. Yes. And, uh, I'm now highly interested to uh, learn more about it because uh, we are familiar in Ethiopia, especially we are familiar with the inductive positive research, the conventional right. positive research. Uh, and I hope we will uh, learn a lot about, I will learn a lot about, uh, or it may help us uh, in, oh, I might. Yeah. Okay. in terms of, in terms of, uh, but I have one, one question. Okay. I, I hope we, we will face uh, challenges in terms of uh, introducing this concept, especially the deductive positive analysis, because our professors, many professors in Ethiopia are, uh, stuck in the conventional way of knowledge generation. That means they know that most of them are familiar with the quantitative research, and some of them are good in positive research. But I'm sure there will be a resistance. How can positive research can be used in the process of testing hypothesis? And this will be a big challenge, but uh, we have to uh, introduce the concept, and I yes. think it will be of a great significance for to advance our professional career and to come up with better findings. Well, I, one of you, and I can't remember who, talked about hypothesizing. I think it was Armand, yeah. Was it you? That you were yeah. hypothesizing. And so I think we do it automatically, that we hypothesize especially if we have some training and research. Mm -hmm. And so we hypothesize and then we test the hypotheses quantitatively, but there's yeah. no reason why you can't hypothesize and test hypotheses qualitatively. Mm -hmm. And I think if you explain that to people to say, you know, I do have ideas, I do have hypotheses I'd like to test, but I have to be very careful that I don't just collect data that um, support my hypothesis. What you, what you want to do, you want to truly test that hypothesis. And by truly testing the hypothesis, what you do is that you go out and you listen to people and, and, um, and you ask questions. And once you have an idea, a general ideas, then you start looking for the exceptions. And you ask people directly, was there ever a time when that didn't happen? Was there ever a time when you didn't feel that way? Was there ever a time when that person did not act that way? So to test hypotheses requires excellent uh, listening skills because you really want to yeah. understand what people are saying. You want to compare what people are saying to your original hypothesis and you want to see if you already have reason to change or add to that hypothesis. But then you ask specific questions to test the hypothesis as because you're going to continually change it. So it's, it's always an emerging hypothesis. So you ask specific questions to undermine your own thinking. Was there ever a time when you didn't, when you wanted to hit your wife and you didn't? You know, and, and what, what went through your mind then? You know what I mean? It's that sort of thing. Um, so you, you want to explain to people that it, it, it's just... The other part of it is, is that we do it every day. You know, you hypothesize, you know, about... Um, Gee, you know, it, it's it, the clouds are really dark today. I hypothesize that I it might rain, and so maybe I need to wear something that's going to keep me dry. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we hypothesize all the time. Um, we, we, we do it so much that we don't even notice that we do it. So I think to, to sell hypothesis testing qualitatively requires, you know, it's kind of like common sense. You know, my baby is crying. Well, I hypothesize the diaper needs to be changed, or nappy, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> yeah. the, the child is hungry, the child is lonely. Mm -hmm. You have different hypotheses, so you change the diaper. Or the child still cries, and you say, well, maybe the child <laughs> is hungry, so then you feed the child, and the, and the child gets fed, and then the child still is fussy, so you say, oh, the child wants to play. Mm -hmm. See? It's that kind of thing. You're continually hypothesizing and testing the hypothesis, and you observe what happens. And then if it works, fine, and if it doesn't, then you hypothesize something else. You know? So we do it all the time. It's a very natural way of thinking. It is a way of thinking. As a matter of fact, that's another thing that John Dewey has said over and over again. Is that, um, and, and, and Anselm Strauss said the same thing. Anselm Strauss said that, Grounded theory is a way of thinking. And when you really think about thinking, you see, yeah, he had a really good point. And grounded theory is a way of thinking is in that book of readings that I sent you. Yeah, I interviewed Anselm. Um, oh, no, Anselm wrote that for, for a little newsletter I wrote. So it's a really short, wonderful, well-written piece. Uh, Anselm Strauss, by the way, was one of the kindest, nicest men I've ever met in my whole life. He was wonderful. So does that, does that help you? Does that response help you? Cindy may have some response too, but does that, so far, does that make sense to you that you just explained? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. Is it uh, uh, you, you, you are absolutely right that we always uh, make hypotheses about everything. We do. In daily life. We do. It's uh, it's uh, really our it's part of our uh, life. It is. Hypothesis. It is. Uh, but uh, I have still issues in the way how we test hypotheses. For example. Um, there is an issue of representation, especially when we are dealing with uh, research, especially quantity research. Mm -hmm. There are some uh, some assumptions that must be made before uh, uh, testing hypothesis, especially in quant quantity research, not quantity research. Test hypothesis. Therefore, uh, my my issue will be how can we uh, uh, test our hypothesis? Okay. Well, first of all, I need to know what you mean by assumptions. Yeah, for example, for uh, for quantity research, uh, there might be some important uh, assumptions to be made before uh, before conducting uh, the test. There are different types of tests. For example, there, there is t-test, there is uh, ANOVA, and and the like. They have their own assumption. The first important thing is uh, the issue of representation. The data, the data must be the quantitative data must be representative of, or the sample should be representative of the entire population. Mm. Therefore, uh, we are in quantitative research. We are meeting some people. How can that be, uh, especially while dealing with social issues, where we will be able uh, to uh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. relatively yeah. small amount of people? How can the yeah. fact from such people can be used? Uh, to generalize that for the entire population. You wanna Therefore, my point is both right. the issue of representation and general, mm -hmm. general, generalizing the uh, finding right. of the entire population. Okay. Mm. Do you want to respond to you? Um, sure. I mean, you can respond. Yeah. Jane. Okay. Uh, yes. I, I actually like quantitative research because it's so fussy. You know, you have to think about this, you have to think about that, and yeah. da, da, da. I mean, there are so many rules, and rules kind of intrigue me, and so I don't mind following rules. You know, fine. I mean, you say these are the rules about doing a t-test, or regression, or, you know, whatever. And so, fine, I'll follow the rules. I mean, that's what you want me to do? Fine. I have no problem with that. Okay. Now, in terms of representation, um, 
And generalization, a generalizability, first of all, quantitative research does, is almost never a representative sample. Yeah. Never. I mean, you can start with a random sample, mm -hmm. which is fine, but how are you going to get a random sample that's truly random? I mean, if you use phone numbers, most people aren't, a lot of people don't have phones or they have private numbers that you don't have access to. So you don't even have a representative sample mm -hmm. to start okay. with. Or say, theoretically, you have a representative sample to start with, people drop out. Mm -hmm. And so you no longer have a representative sample. So mostly what we do in quantitative research is actually quasi-experimental, mm -hmm. which means we're, we're doing the best we can. We wanted a representative sample, we don't have it. And so what we have is a non-representative sample. So we'll do the best we can. And even if you have a representative sample, what's true for that sample might not be true for the individual. Exactly. Because that's yeah. the ecological fallacy. Like uh, when I, you know, 40 years ago, people were saying adult children of alcoholics are all messed up. Well, I knew a lot of adult children of alcoholics who weren't messed up. And that's yeah. because they had a lot of resilience. They had a lot of positive factors in their lives. And so um, we have to be very careful about that. So with qualitative research, um, we don't have random samples, or nor do we really want random samples. Um, what we want is a good, rounded uh, picture of a particular phenomenon in a particular context. So I want, so for, so for my research, I want a sample of people who have had adversities and who turned out to be law-abiding citizens who contribute to the welfare of society. So I want to understand that group. So if I want to understand that group, I have to start talking to individuals. And so the first thing I do is I try to understand their experiences from their points of view. So I try to represent what they're saying, not what I think. It's what they're saying. It's really important for me to describe what they're saying. And for me to present it to you, for example, to an audience, I have to organize it. I can't just say this, you know, throw all these ideas around. I have to say, you know, one of the patterns that I saw is the people who were resilient had people in their lives who stood by them over a long period of time and helped them process the, the adversities that they experienced. So they developed a strong sense of who they are. They developed a strong sense of how important it is to talk about things that bother you rather than hurting somebody else because you hurt. So, that's, that's, so you want to represent that. You want to organize that. Now, for general, generalizability, and this is an old, old issue. I've, I've written about it a lot, and I think it is in, in my set of readings somewhere, that the, the kind of generalizability that we do in qualitative research is more analytic generalizability. What, what we say is, okay, this is what we learned about resilience in this sample. There are like several factors associated with good outcomes when people had adversities. So you have to say what a good outcome is, but so these, these are several factors and, and close personal relationships, you know, model, wanting to model your behavior after a pro-social person, those are two main things. So what you say is, okay, we think that this group of people is resilient. So let's take these ideas that they had at least one person in their lives who stood by them and they wanted to be like these pro-social people. Let's see if this works here. So then you want to develop a program based on those ideas. So you develop a program and you say, well, let me see if this program works. Let me see if these interventions work for these people. So Donald Campbell, who is a, like a king to me, I mean like a, not a king, he's like a, a brilliant, wonderful person, and he was my teacher. Donald T. Campbell was okay. my teacher. 
And he said, we live in an experimenting society. So whatever we learn from program evaluations, whatever we learn from any kind of research, we, and we develop a program, this is an experimental program and it's always going to be an experimental program because we have to keep evaluating it to see if it's working or not. And if it's not working, we have to change the program. So that's the point. It's an analytic generalizability. It's always a matter of testing for fit. And it's an always a matter of having evidence yeah. to change the program. If you change the program, you've got to have good evidence to do so. If you start a program, you have to base it on good evidence. And evidence isn't necessarily just research. It can be, you know, what people in the community say is needed. You know, it can be uh, what you learned in another setting yourself as an evaluator, I mean, or as our program developer. So it's always experimental. And, and to me, it's so humbling because I'm not the expert anymore. You know, everybody counts in this. And we have to weigh the evidence, you know, and we have to have people to help us develop programs. But we're all sort of in this together. And so, and we know we could be wrong. In fact, sometimes we want to be wrong, because if we're wrong, then we can correct it. And make yeah. the program better, or make the theory better. Yeah. I like to be wrong because I think, oh my God, I, I learned something. I learned something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. No, and, and it kind of touches upon member checking is even when I was doing the analysis with, with a second coder of the interviews, we thought that we had developed, uh, you know, strong concepts. But when we went to back to the participants of the study um, to do member checking, they're like, well, you know, maybe you can add this or I, I don't know if that's really representative of what I said and so it added more to the variation and so I think that goes back to generalizability and that um, I, I don't know if that's ever truly possible because I mean I think people are constantly um, thinking very differently based off of uh, things that happen uh, throughout their day I mean maybe we may have catch that gentleman on a good day and then the second time I came back yeah. to him for member checking he was having yeah. a terrible day and didn't like where we were going <laughs> with the you know certain <laughs> concepts um, but but it was you know there's different ways I think to check for that too um, but but I do understand the concern with um, you know your advisor wanting uh, something that's generalizable um, but I think if it's something that's context specific I think that's just as equally valuable to know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Wow. A, a lot of lessons Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a lot of thinking. I mean, when, when yeah. Strauss said qualitative research is the way of thinking, he, yeah. he hit the nail right on the head. He was exactly right. It is a way of thinking, and, and it's a way of respecting other people's way of life. You know, it, there's such deep respect that um, goes on when you're doing... Uh, these two types of research because you really, 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 really want to understand what is going on for you, what do these things mean to you, you know, what, um, what are your experiences, what do you think would be helpful to you and your family, what do you think would be helpful to your community. I mean, you keep asking them um, about their experiences and their thoughts. Yeah. Um, can I add one more question? Sure. Uh, can we, therefore, can we consider uh, deductive qualitative uh, research uh, as a bridge between quantitative research mm. and qualitative research? Well, why don't you say a little bit more about why you think that could be true? Mm, because uh, especially uh, there is a there has been a growing concern uh, between 
uh, extreme positivists and uh, extreme uh, constructivists, especially the concerning the, the, the nature of reality. People, especially positivists, may think that uh, reality is objective, it can be touched, it can be seen. On the other hand, the constructivists may argue that reality is subjective to the individual. Individual experiences and perspectives matters most than the objective reality. Uh, so, these two approaches, in my opinion, uh, uh, as far as my knowledge is concerned, have different procedures of approaching the world, approaching the reality and testing the reality. They use different uh, uh, approaches. Uh, the, the positivist one, for example, they use standard, standardized tools to test uh, the, the existence of an phenomenon or not. They used, they used uh, standard tools because they, they think that reality is objective and everyone can test reality uh, uh, similarly. The other one, the constructivists, they use, they are eager to learn more from the uh, individual. They they are interested in the exploring the individual perspective towards the reality. Uh, we are we are not saying that. Uh, uh, we can use or we can deductively conduct equitative research. Uh, most of the time, as I said earlier, uh, the deduction or deductive approach is most of the quantitative one. It's used by quantitative researchers. They there is general truth and they deduct the reality, or they there is a theory and they try to uh, uh, capitalize on that theory. Uh, but for the quantity one, it's an inductive one. We are trying to understand it and come up with a new perspective or theory. Uh, and it's just my understanding, and I'm ready to learn that. Can we therefore consider deductive quantity uh, research as uh, mm -hmm. the bridge between these two uh, extreme? Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. And yeah, do you see what he's saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you can. You know, make make a an argument for that in the sense that there's a kinship. You know, there's a connection between uh, deductive qualitative research and uh, deductive quantitative research, in that each of them does begin with ideas or concepts or hypotheses or questions. You know, sometimes pretty specific questions. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't think of them as of, of DQA as a bridge between the two. But I do see the kinship. I do see the relationship, and I do see the importance of acknowledging mm -hmm. prior ideas, and I see the importance of hypothesis testing qualitatively. I, I, I see the value. Of testing hypothesis quantitatively too, but I I like and the questions I have, you know, are fit qualitative research much better. Uh, so yeah, I think you can you can say that. You can say, look, you know, if you, if somebody's really trained in quantitative research and is open to what you've got to say, you could say, look, there are things that are in common between deductive qualitative research and deductive quantitative research. What's different is when you're doing uh, deductive qualitative research, you're continually changing the hypothesis in the course of research. Oh, okay. And when I first heard that, I thought, that's cheating. <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to do that. When you do uh, hypothesis okay. testing, you test the hypothesis, you know, through some kind of survey, and then either you uphold the hypothesis or you don't. And yeah. your data may say change the hypothesis, which is fine. I mean, that's what you want. But in, but in, in qualitative deductive research, you change the hypothesis as you're doing the research. And after a while, I saw that it wasn't cheating. But <laughs> the, when I first heard it, I thought, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah. 
So that's the big difference. I think that's the huge difference is that we want to change the hypothesis. We're doing the research to make the hypothesis more accurate, you know, more mm -hmm. to, to fit the situations better because we're only one person and you know, we're hypothesizing this or we might get the hypothesis out of somebody else's research, but that's still, you know, a limited perspective. And when we test hypotheses qualitatively, we're getting many more perspectives. We're making the hypothesis better. We may develop two or three related hypotheses, which is really good because then you can, uh, you know, develop a program, you can develop a policy that, you know, again, that's tentative and that you would change when and if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then you uh, keep it if it works. Yeah. Okay, we're getting, uh, okay, sir? yes. Okay. Uh, is it possible to get uh, basic guide, uh, a book, just kind of give us a book about both perspectives about dedu deductive qualitative research and ground theory? Yeah, the, uh, the article that I wrote uh, for Bryant and Chamez that I sent last week, uh, okay, it's, so it begins sorry. with sensitizing concepts and yeah, it's in it's in there pretty clearly. Okay. Yeah, the two. Yeah, so I would study that. Maybe that would be your assignment. How how about that? Read that. Okay. Okay. Read okay. read the Bryant and Shamas article that I wrote. Okay. Okay, and I but I have another thing I want you to do, and it's on okay. a, a little sheet here, <laughs> and that is okay. I want you to code. I want you to code, I, and and so code, yeah, code is a is is code is 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 analysis. Now, if you code something, you have to have data. Yeah. Now you can code if you've written your positionality statement. You can code that. So your positionality statement should be pretty descriptive. There shouldn't be a whole lot of analysis, like analysis means reflection, you're saying what it means, and blah, 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 blah. You know, you, you just need a description of something. So, I don't know, do you, is, is your positionality statement descriptive? Do you, do you have a written statement? It's okay if you don't, because I can, I can, I can send you or Cindy could send you, we could send you a piece of data to analyze. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you want us to do that. Okay, okay, so the assignment. Okay, so Cindy will send something, I'll send something, and you can choose which one you want to analyze. So we, uh, we will send maybe two pages. Sure. Yeah, yeah. it will be brief. We will just send, send maybe two pages. Okay. Now, to code, there are two different ways to code. Do you want to explain grounded theory coding and I'll explain DQA coding? Sure, sure. Um, so, I did my coding according to constructivist grounded theory. Um, and so, the two pages that I'll be sending you, I'm thinking of maybe two pages from an interview that I conducted, yeah, for that study. Yeah, I think I'll probably just send the two pages from that, but I, I'll just... Uh, I think most of the information is de-identified, so I, I think it should be okay. Yeah, we'll just we, you won't know who the people are. Yeah, yeah, um, but but yeah. So my um, the second coder and I, um, and for this assignment, you'll just be doing it on your own, uh, so you won't have a second coder. Uh, but I started off with um, I, there was really three steps for me. Um, I considered it three steps in my head, and so the first step was initial coding. Um, and so with initial coding, I went literally line by line and I used um, more action words to describe what was going on uh, for each line. And I've, I've heard of other um, researchers who code in sections, uh, but for me, I prefer coding line by line because I think there's a lot of nuanced meanings in each of those lines that could get um, overlooked if you're just coding by section or just a paragraph. 
Um, so I, I do encourage you to do initial coding by doing line by line. Uh, it, it takes a little bit more time, but two pages shouldn't be too bad. Okay, so <laughs> if they were doing line by line coding, mm -hmm. um, let's see. Here, uh, let's give an example. Ah. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, on our summary, the first mm -hmm. one says need for Ethiopia specific social work research and the importance of recognizing multiple influences on the people with whom we work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you were to do a line by line coding, how mm -hmm. would you code that? Because coding means you attach a word mm -hmm. to what is ever in your text. So mm -hmm. how would you code that? Need for Ethiopian yeah. specific research. And the importance of recognizing yeah. multiple influences. influences what would, what would, with whom we work. Yeah, what would, how would you code that? Or maybe you need to go a little bit further with the rest of the <laughs> yeah. sentence. Yeah, but maybe with that first sentence, um, I, I would maybe code that as uh, seeking new method or something like that. Yeah. And, and if the nice thing about having a second coder is they could have a completely different interpretation of just that one line. Okay, now if I were to code this, need for social work specific research and the importance of recognizing multiple influences on the people with whom we work, mm -hmm. what jumps out at me is multiple influences. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, so I would, I would note that as a code. I would take that as a code. I would say multiple influences is one of the codes that I just identified. And then the other code for me is Ethiopia specific social work research. That's a second code. Yes, so there could be multiple codes coming yeah. from one line. Yeah, so you look at one line and you say, okay, what stands out for me? So that's one way of coding. Social Ethiopia specific social work research is a code. And then the, the other code is rec multiple influences on the pe on people. So then, the, I, I would look, I would read, and I would read line by line and pick out key ideas, key terms. And when when you use a code that's a word that's already in the text, that's called an uh, an in situ code. Mm -hmm. So some of the codes. The names of the codes are, are, are what's in the text. There may be times when you look at a line and you say, oh, this is an example of self-centeredness, even if the word self-centeredness isn't in the text. So, are you still there? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so some codes are sort of indigenous <laughs> or uh, in situ, and some codes you import. Okay. So when you do a line by line analysis, you want to look for terms that you think are important, like Ethiopia specific social work research, that's an in situ code. But if somebody is saying, I saw this uh, woman walking down the street and all I wanted to do was rape her, you know, I would probably think, well, that's pretty self-centered. What might she want? See what I mean? So he didn't Sorry. say he was being self-centered, but I labeled that as an example of self-centeredness. Okay. See, there are two different types of codes that you do in line-by-line -line coding. You see? Okay, is that clear? Plus, it can be subjective, I think. Yeah, and that's okay, because you're going to talk to so many people that after a while it might not be. Yeah. But yeah. we'll get to that. Don't worry about that yet. Just yeah. just do just do this. Yes. And okay. It, and it's an interpretive process. Yeah, don't yeah. worry about it. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but right now just get the mechanics. We want you to know the mechanics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the mechanics. That's what this is. Turn off your thinking. <laughs> Just turn it off. Okay. Just do what okay. we're telling you to do. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes I'm, I'm when you... I'm working on it. All right, good. Yeah, because I think sometimes the difficulty of thinking too much is that you actually spend more time just doing that initial coding that you're already, I think, moving on to the next uh, phase of coding and then you may be missing out on a lot of other opportunities. Yeah, you're going to have plenty of time to think, yeah. but not now. Right now, all you want to do is keep labeling. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm gonna I'll write this up for you too, so you'll have it. Okay, so that's the line by line code. Yeah. Right, sorry, oh I interrupted. No, so that's, no, that's that's the first beautiful. one. Two types of codes. Mm -hmm. All yes. right. Yes, and so after the stage of initial <coughs> coding, um, you move on to focus codes, and so that's really because once you're done doing initial coding, you may I mean I, hopefully with the two pages it may be. 30 to 40 uh, just open codes um, and so the next step is focus coding and it's really organizing these open codes and you may have yeah 30 or 40 of them into larger categories and so it's really organizing them in a way that makes sense um, and in a way that they relate to one another um, so that's focus coding and I I believe it's called axial coding as well uh, there's different yeah. names um, but what I used, um, the name I gave it was Focus Coding and just following Charmaz, um, yeah, and how she kind of labeled uh, this next stage of coding. Um, so really just pulling all those open codes into larger categories. Um, and then the third step after you have those larger categories, and an example for my dissertation is I think when I did my initial coding, we end up with hundreds, hundreds of codes, um, just open codes. And then once we did focus coding, um, where we pulled all these hundreds of uh, codes into larger categories, we um, ended up with 31 uh, large categories. Um, and then from there, we organized them more into 17 categories. And so it's, it's a continuous process. Um, and I mean, you know, sometimes things strike you as you're driving, hopefully not literally, but uh, ideas come to you even as you're driving, as you're laying in bed late at night thinking about things. Um, and so categories continue to uh, take shape even as you're moving on to the next stage of coding. Um, and then after focus coding, um, if you have the time, um, and if you do, uh, you move on to theoretical coding. And I did theoretical coding and diagramming at the same time of from these 17 categories, uh, finding ways in which they link and relate to one another uh, to create a conceptual model. Um, so that was the process that I undertook um, in terms of coding the interviews. And it, it, it's not, um, it's a process that takes a lot of time. I think it was an intense uh, half year of really just uh, sticking to the data. Um, there was a lot of... Uh, yeah, uncertainty. Um, I wasn't sure whether I would even get to a final result, um, one that I would be confident in presenting and sharing. Um, but yeah, I mean, even today, there are times when I look at the conceptual model and I wonder if there's even other ways that someone else would organize the data. And I, I, I think they would organize it a bit differently too. And so just keep that in mind that this is your interpretation of the data. Wow. Okay. All right. We will write this down for you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Cindy, Cindy will write up yeah, that I, part, I'm and I'll write, write up the DQ A part. Now, with DQA, it's a little bit different <clears throat> because what you do is you take your codes from your hypotheses, your question, or your sensitizing concept, because you can begin T DQA with a concept, like I began with gender, you know, years ago when I started my research, that was my main concept, gender. Or you can start with a hypothesis or a question. So an example of a hypothesis is, uh, in, in say in my redemptive violence uh, study, I used the theory of redemptive violence as my hypothesis, I hypothesized that the theory of redemptive violence and its myth would fit into personal violence. So, the concepts were redemptive violence, uh, you know, uh, anticipating good outcomes, chaos, because people uh, believe redemptive violence restores order to chaotic situations. So, one sensitizing concept, one concept that I started with is 
what is the chaos that people are experiencing? So I, I, I coded transcripts for chaos. So I look for chaos. Okay, I coded, concept, I coded the transcripts for order. What order were they looking for? So what was their experience of the order that they were seeking? And then what was their experience of the order that they actually experienced? And then I looked for, were there other consequences? And one of the concepts that I identified that I didn't anticipate was moral injury. Because some people experienced guilt and shame over what they had done. Okay, so first step, write out your question, your hypothesis, or your sensitizing concept. Then identify the concepts that are in the hypothesis, the question, or the concept, and the concepts become the codes. The concepts become the codes, and then you read the transcripts and you do line by line again. You do do line by line. Do line by line, looking for chaos, order that they wanted, and order that they got, and what else is there that I didn't anticipate. So, and the what else is the beginning of what's called positive case analysis. Positive case analysis means that you're looking for things that your theory does not anticipate. That means you're looking for exceptions. And you automatically, when you're doing a positive case analysis, you're looking for variations. Because, say, somebody who um, uh, uses pornography, for example, there may be various reasons and various experiences that people use pornography. So if you're going to talk about the use of pornography, you want to capture all the variations. Like some people who use pornography swear they would never ever act any of it out. And I think that's true for some people, but then I have to go back and do an analysis of their life histories to see if that's true. And if they have a lot of resources and a lot of positive experiences, it is likely that the use of pornography won't lead them to molest kids or rape women. But there are other people whose use of pornography is just an aid to rape and child molestation and all kinds of other things. So that's what I mean by you look for variations. Okay, so that, that's it. And then um, you end up with a tested and refined hypothesis. Now, you probably won't be able to do all of that. I think for next week, I think that what would be really important is for you just to have the experiences of coding. And you may have some initial ideas about changing hypotheses, or you may have some initial ideas about how the various codes are connected to each other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, to, to code an actual study does take quite a long time. But we just want you to have the experience of coding. You know, it's, you, you've talked about practicality, and practicality is really important. Uh, the, second, the other thing you could do is you could talk to a knowledgeable person, um, you know, somebody whose ideas you're interested in, and um, you could transcribe that. You know, just, just, and you know, it, so maybe talk for 10 minutes because you don't want a long transcript. You know, talk to somebody for five or 10 minutes, transcribe it, and then code that. Okay. Yeah, so, I, think, I think that would be interesting. Because that would be closer to um, your own interest. Could, co uh, just could, could uh, code a brief, a transcript of a brief conversation. Mm hmm. Or you could even 
describe you could even you could even write a positionality statement now but just describe it or you could describe an experience you had as a social worker so you could you could work on your own positionality statement and, and write a page just write a page I am interested in this topic because of this I mean I, I've got two pivotal stories about why I became a social worker and they were, they were transformative moments and I hadn't really thought about social work to be honest but I had two experiences that just were like oh my god I want to do this work so you could write about a pivotal moment how I became a social worker or how I discovered this is what I want to do my research on so so you could just write a page and then do the line by line coding but make sure when you're talking about this pivotal moment in your own life make sure it's only descriptive don't talk about oh my granny said you know blah 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 or you know I think this means that and that don't put in any interpretation just describe just describe that pivotal moment um, that's important to you and I heard some of those pivotal moments in what you said today and so I'd love to hear more about them to tell you the truth because um, I think pivotal moments are just wonderful so so yeah you can write you can interview you can use what we send yeah Jane I really like that idea of yeah I think going back to that positionality statement because I think Irma as you talked earlier about being born and raised in an extended family I mean mm -hmm. you could just write a whole page about that and then just code it yeah, yeah. I think that'd be okay. amazing yeah it'd be great, great. it'd be great and then, yeah. yeah that would be wonderful yeah. so what do you think we've got what we've got about nine eight minutes yeah uh, I think uh, okay please. no no carry on just that Okay. Uh, I would like to say that uh, I would like to say thank you very much. I, I I've got so much lessons today, uh, and uh, I think it will be a turning point for me to reconsider my research topic and reconsider the, my research approach. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. Oh, I, you you two are really terrific. I've really enjoyed our time together too. Anything else? We still have some time. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, actually, I was uh, trying to uh, take some notes while you, are, uh, you guys are talking, but uh, we need other guidance, really. We don't have that much good exposure regarding the uh, grounded uh, theory and the uh, deductive qualitative research, so we, we will be very much happy to uh, work with you, and uh, we need your guidance. Really. Great. Okay. Well, this, uh, we, we're here for you. Yes. Okay. And, and you're uh, here for us. I mean, I'm learning so much too. I mean, I'm really enjoying this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is not just a one-way street no, of learning. No, it's, it's Yeah. We're learning just as much um, from all of you, actually. Mm-hmm. It's been, it's terrific, yeah. Okay, well, I'll work on the video. The first part of the video, okay. I think well, you're going you're gonna to see uh, our chins, because um, I didn't have it set up right. But the second half should, should be good. And uh, we'll send you the uh, homework, um, and then I, there's something else. Maybe we'll do a brief summary. And if you want to do a brief summary and send it to us, that would be great, too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, plus, you can get my email on the uh, chat. Uh, okay, I'll dare to look now. Said, uh, please send me the all necessary documents regarding the resilience. Please, uh, from, uh, oh, wait a minute! I don't now. see it. It's or a, I will, I will, I will directly email it to you. Yeah, I don't see it now. Okay, I will email it to you directly. Great. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. And see you next week. Bye.
Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Bye bye. Good luck with all this unrest. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah.